welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project. I'm your host, Akoma Marunu, and I created this show to help lawyers find happiness in life with a law degree. Together with my guest, we provide the knowledge, insight, skills, inspiration, and encouragement you need to find your happy. Today, I'm sharing my conversation with Kelly Damasio. She's a Massachusetts licensed attorney and real estate broker working as a division director with Parker Lynch Legal. In other words, Kelly is a legal recruiter. I originally reached out to Kelly because she recently conducted a survey on associate retention, and I was super interested to hear the results of her survey, and especially interested to see if they were consistent with what I was hearing from the lawyers that I talked to. As a recent lateral, I have to admit, I've talked to a lot of recruiters, and I'm going to warn you guys that they aren't all as knowledgeable as Kelly. So I'm also super excited to share her insights on the lateral process and tips for working with a recruiter. So let's get to the show. Welcome, Kelly, to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for being on. I usually like to start the show by having my guests do a little introduction about who they are and what they do. Okay. So my name is Kelly Dematio. I am a legal recruiter with Parker and Lynch Legal. So that is the permanent search division of special counsel. We are the nation's largest staffing uh, resource. We do everything from permanent attorney searches to temp draft hire, as well as manage review, doc review, and e-discovery solutions. Fantastic. And just as a disclaimer, Although I recently lateraled, I did not work with Kelly. So this is not a personal endorsement, but Kelly seemed great. So I wanted to have her on the show. And she actually recently did an associate retention survey that I thought was really interesting. So I wanted to get her on to talk about that. But before we dive into that, I'd love for you to share a little bit about why you chose to work in legal recruiting. Yeah, so it was a very unique process. I don't think anyone goes to law school with the anticipation to work as a legal recruiter. But what had happened, I had, I went to UCLA undergrad in Villanova Law. And when I came out, I had a pretty strong public interest focus. So in Massachusetts, I had lined up with a government agency, passed the bar, was ready to start, and unfortunately, budgets were cut. So that left me kind of high and dry. So I ended up going to agency is trying to learn about what opportunities were out there. And while I was interviewing, my now executive director had asked me if I had any interest in legal recruiting. So it sounded unique and interesting. So I just dove right in and I've been doing it for about three years now. But what I really love about it is the strategy behind it. I still, you know, get to go in and negotiate deals, but I actually really genuinely get to help people to see their faces, especially laterals coming from, you know, smaller markets to the Boston market and really helping them out financially as well as just career opportunities. It's been a really, really just a great opportunity for me to be able to help people the way I wanted to originally. That's really a wonderful perspective and it's great to have people working with lawyers who understand what it is to be a lawyer in some regard, because you've been through the kind of the grueling process of law school and the bar exam. And I know there's kind of the recruiters who are not lawyers and who are more of like HR people. And then there are the ones who are more legally minded. So I think that's always an interesting process to see how that affects the way they work. Yeah, and honestly, even from a client's perspective, I think that's where being a licensed attorney helps way more. I'm able to get a lot more face time with the partners themselves versus HR managers or recruiting departments. And they actually do go into specific nuances of the law. So, you know, it's not just I need a corporate associate, you know, these are the parameters. It's saying, hey, here are my clients. This is what we're looking to do. This is how I think this cap can mushroom out. This is the type of entrepreneurial spirit that I want to join the team. So it's more so vetting out the type of personalities, the type of work, obviously, experience, but also what I could plan for the future in an attorney when making a lateral move. So that's the fun part. And I think that, and, and Parker and Lynch Legal does a great job. We historically only recruit attorneys to become legal recruiters just for that sake, just to use our networks as well as kind of just gain an underlying trust with clients. That totally makes sense. So let's talk a little bit more about this associate retention survey and kind of what you discovered when you conducted the survey. Yeah, so this actually 
spun out organically. I had been working with a regional firm here in Boston, and they have been just doing very well and growing pretty organically over the past couple of years. And I've made a handful of placements with them. So they had asked me to put together a presentation on my recruiting efforts, how I get candidates to go to their firm, but also they are keeping in mind retention because now they have a pool of really awesome candidates. They want to make sure that their attorneys are happy and stay and grow with the firm and become partners. So as we were discussing, I thought it'd be interesting to put together a survey to not only kind of spell out why people make a lateral move, but also why people stay what kind of opportunities are out there that people are looking for moving into the future. Obviously, the rationales behind any move, but also the demographics of, you know, who would respond to such a survey. So what I did is I did a nationwide blanket. So I went online and just kind of sporadically blasted everyone. So apologies if anyone got the email. (laughs) But about 771 associates from various uh, JD years responded. And I was actually pretty shocked to find it was almost a perfect split between amongst the, the class years. So about 24% junior associates, 26% uh, mid-level, 20% senior, and then 27 above. So because of that, I actually got a nice skew of data. So it wasn't so much the, hey, I'm in a big law environment, I'm not a sophisticated practice, but I'm just kind of stuck in a room, you know, doing menial work. It, it's the underlying rationales of, you know, why I'm staying, why I'm leaving, which was really great that I got such a variety of responses out of. Yeah. yeah. How surprising. I, I wasn't sure how you got it to be so evenly split. So. <laughs> I was pleasantly pleased. <laughs> That's so funny. So when you when the answers came back, what did you find were common reasons that people stay? Because obviously, I'm somebody who's really interested in retention, because I think Firms spend a lot of their time recruiting and they have these really long recruiting pipelines. And I think that's really fantastic. But then the problem is that people come and they don't stay. And that's especially hard when you start to think about laterals because they don't have the same loyalty and roots and kind of community that they're coming into. And so kind of getting them ingrained into this new system and retaining them after you've invested all the money in attracting them is so important. It is, it is, and it is actually really very much at the forefront of a lot of my clients too, which is good to hear. So number one reason why people stay was the people themselves that they work with and loyalty, whether it be a really respectful culture where partners come and check in and they give constructive feedback. I had one person respond that their managing partner just checks in on the workload. They are They are cognizant that they're doing great work as well as pro bono initiatives. They want to make sure that they're given every resource if they needed any extra assistance with anything. Also, respect for just the community as a whole. They trust that the people they work with are hardworking, they're ethical, they're helpful, and that they're in a really good brand together. And then, you know, working one-on-one with a partner, I cannot tell you across the board how many people truly value that relationship. When I polled, you know, I had asked I'd ask the associates to ping which which options what were one of the leading reasons why they stay. And over 87% said that it was the people they work with. In terms of most surprising, though, was the flexible work arrangements. And I actually think that this goes hand in hand with trust and respect. I on the on, on the converse side, why associates lateral flexible work arrangements are right up there as well. So I think where work environments are making the time to allow technology for remote access, flexible schedules, not being a FaceTime firm, I think there is a great deal of acknowledgement and your own abilities if a firm is saying, hey, you cannot autonomously manage your own schedule. We trust your independence. You can set your own hours. I was just talking with a mid-level associate who is in real estate development, and they were saying that you know they have almost brought in over a million book of business on their own, which is amazing for someone at that level. But what they do is they're in the office. If they hit a roadblock, they actually go fly fishing and they take some time kind of just shut down. And they said that they can almost always work through the problems. They come back home and they bang out the work. So they're getting the hours in. It's just an unconventional style of thinking. And it's interesting. We are in a society where our phones are attached to our head 
we're always on. I'm the same way. I'll get an email at 10 o'clock and I hop back on and do everything. And if a work environment can accommodate that and acknowledgement, because you're always working, I think that that's one of the leading reasons that, you know, associates are staying. It's just the inherent trust to have an ability like that. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy because (laughs) (laughs) there's so many things you said in there that are really in alignment with the research that I've been doing. And so my podcast is really focused on bringing more happiness to the associate and like legal practice because everything shows that the happier you are, the more creative you are, the better you work. You know, there's just all sorts of amazing results that come out of really focusing on happiness. And I'm like, I was shocked. Like every time I read one of these studies, I'm just shocked at what the practical implications are for what a better employee you are if you're happy. In one specific study they did, they had like doctors get primed to be happy before they had to look at this really complicated case. And the doctors that were happy going into it not only solved it two and a half times faster, but had a more creative range of solutions. And the way they were primed to be happy beforehand is they were given a piece of candy. (laughs) Like it wasn't even like a complicated thing they had to do. That was just this like subliminal thing that they just kind of put a little something in their pocket before they walked into this research. And the results are huge. Do you know what I mean? No, completely. And it is funny to use the fly fishing example. I it's it's something so small and exactly time intensive, but it does you know kind of break down that barriers and allow for creative thought. And and I know firms are trying to make initiatives, whether successful, how much successful they'll have with it, but. It's chair massages or masseuses or catered meals or I know firms in Boston have a process called manicure where they'll have a manicurist yeah. come and do so cheap nails. So it's the little add-ons. I was just at a firm and they throw a monthly birthday party. So it's the Thursday of the last Thursday of the month. They just throw a birthday party <laughs> for everyone whose birthday it was and there's always cake and food and all that just to have some downtime just to kind of acknowledge everyone and get some social hour. So it is important to realize that there is a churn and burn kind of style of, of working, but you need to move past that. And associates, junior associates, middle associates, senior associates, we're all just human beings. And that's where I think firms that really go out of their way to acknowledge that and to really help and grow in their personal life. And to segue on that, the family-friendly atmosphere as well. So that's been a huge one across the board. Parental leave policies, also domestic relations as well, um, domestic partners. We're seeing a huge shift in that to be more universally applicable and accommodating. Some firms, especially here in Boston, will do six-month paid leave, which is awesome. And I know that firms actually <laughs> so she's moved to firms like that, so they know it's an accommodating culture. And when they get back, they allow associates to come on board with a modified schedule until they're ramped up to full time because it can be difficult when you're off and then just being thrown back into the lion's den. Some provide daycare in the building, then others just will accommodate emergency daycare if things come up. And that also plays into the flexible schedule. If you have a young child and there's an emergency and they need to be taken out of daycare because they're sick. My sister's an attorney and three she has three children under five and I cannot tell you how often she has to kind of drop everything and take care of, you know, picking one of them up and then just logging on back out at work at home. But she's able to do that. And she's luckily in an environment that she is and she'll work weekends and she gets her hours in, but there is some flexibility to it. Yeah. And I think that programs are super important. And I have two young kids, three and one. And with both, I took almost the entire six months and I came back on a flexible work schedule as well. So I'm very familiar and very grateful for these programs. And I guess my question to you is, I know a lot of people have the programs, but associates don't necessarily feel comfortable using them. Yes, it is more so the paternal leave is what what I see that is not getting used as much. Some are are, are making a stride to actually fully take advantage of it, which is awesome. But I think some there's still some stereotypes that are in the law. And that's where, you know, some males are not as comfortable taking the leave, which is silly because it's a part of your benefit package. And when, you know, negotiating compensation is a huge part of my job. But 
thinking about, you know, paid days off, benefits, matching 401k, all of that is goes into your bottom line. It's not just you, the base you get, the bonus. All of that is, is value added to what you provide to the firm. So if you're not taking advantage of it, you're essentially leaving money on the table or even, you know, obviously the personal growth opportunities, bonding and, and child care that just it completely entails. But it is a financial piece of the puzzle when you are making a move and signing on with the firm. So it's kind of silly to not take advantage of those opportunities. Oh my gosh, I completely agree. And I would also point out that one of the another high indicator of happiness and ability to like manage stress is having strong social ties. And I think at a time when your family is going through this transition, to not put the time into building kind of that relationship with your wife in her new role or husband, <laughs> their new role as parent and the new child puts you in a situation where when you come, you are in a really stressful time at work, you know, six months down the road, your wife doesn't see you as an ally in her struggle. Yeah. So now no. you've like, kind of, <laughs> you've kind of fractured that relationship unnecessarily because that time was offered to you and you didn't take it. And I know it's easier said than done, but that's also something that people should take into consideration is how important maintaining those relationships are so they can help maintain you down the road. But looking forward, it is very positive because I am seeing a huge shift of, especially if it is a female male dynamic, males taking the first two weeks off. Yep. And then if they have a flow of weeks, a lot of them pick up where the maternity period leaves off. So now there's an extended coverage. So daycare doesn't start as soon. And then there's that one on one time a little bit later down the line. And I think it might be helpful for a long time. So someone knows what <laughs> the full bearing of child rearing really is. But but I am seeing a shift into that kind of dynamic where they're being more strategic as a family unit in, you know, parsing out and making those decisions when it is maternity coverage or paternity coverage. Absolutely. I mean, and we did the exact same thing. My husband picked up when I left and I think it was, and we had a nanny with him full time, but it was so much easier for me to walk out that door the first day knowing yeah. he would be there the whole day as well. Yeah. So it's great to know that you're seeing that across the board and that people are picking up on it. That's really promising because I think that there is also the added implication of if women are taking the time and men aren't taking the time, there's this kind of feeling that women are less serious about their career than men. Yeah, and unfortunately, when I have told associates about reasons why they are leaving, and I'm actually currently working with a candidate right now and exploring lateral opportunities, there is a little bit of the old school stereotypes that are still in play, and it's the social use issues of either ethics, boys club mentality, sexism, sex sexual harassment, chauvinist partner. I know the candidate I'm working with right now, they actually it's coming from a smaller firm, so there's really no HR capabilities or real true department. So the only person to go to was actually the person who's causing all the, the issues in the first place. So their reason for making a move is it's not because of the firm or the quality of work and they're actually developing the book and, and having a strong career. It's just not something that they want to tie themselves to and subject themselves to day in, day out. And this candidate, she has been married for a little bit, but starting to consider children and, and what the future looks like. And she just doesn't think that that's the best environment because she's not sure how they're going to handle her going on maternity or, you know, what that's going to look like moving forward when, you know, the kids grow and develop and, and how she's going to be viewed in the firm because of that. Yeah. And I think that it speaks to speak further to that point, it's important for people to know that all firms aren't the same. I think sometimes people get this <laughs> idea that like all big laws one way all mid-sized firms are one way, all boutique firms are another way. And it's like has more to do with the size and like the way they conduct business as opposed to the individual people. And, and that's what I interject. That's why I actually kind of love the Boston market. Yep. So I'm biased because I specialize in New England placements, but Boston has some of the nation's strongest law firms, but they are smaller groups. So they are 30 to 60 attorneys. <laughs> so then the crash scripts themselves are even smaller. So it does have that regional mid sized culture and respect and everyone kind of collegiality. But you're getting the national resources, you're getting the international platform and the quality of work. So that's where, you know, there are firms that are out there just because 
it is, I'll say Ropes and Gray because they are the largest in Boston, but just because it's Ropes and Gray in Boston doesn't mean it's Ropes and Gray in Texas, <laughs> you know? Yep. Just so, so all firms, you know, even across the board, it's very, very different just from geography and, and where they're set, set it because it's, it's a different vibe, it's a different culture. And even, as you know, you've been in, in the legal world. Even within the same firm, practice groups are treated completely differently. So it is very interesting to know which group at which firm in what city you're going to. So I have a question. Um, <laughs> what do you think, like, what differentiates a good lateral, like someone who does the process or a good job seeker, or someone who's doing the process right, the questions they're asking, kind of what do they bring to the table so that they're easy to place and easy to put in a place that they're going to be happy? Because I know that not everybody necessarily goes into the process with the right mindset? Yes. And that is a great question. And that's where I prefer working with passive candidates over active candidates for this reason alone. I think once you come to the conclusion that you're making a move, almost always you inherently check out just a little bit. And then when you're actively interviewing, you check out a little bit more. And then you start to get dissatisfied with your current work process. And the recruiting process in general and the interview process, sometimes I can be quick. I've made a placement in literally five days. I've made a placement that's lasted nine months. So you need to understand that it is a process and not to get your hopes up whether someone accepts you or not immediately. So when I say someone's a good lateral, I would say that they're prepared. They know what kind of platform they're looking for and why. It's not just a, I need out of here. I'm going to quit any moment, get me into a new position. I think it's someone who interviews and actually feels comfortable asking the questions that they need to ask. It's very much like dating. You just don't go on a blind date. <laughs> Say that someone likes you and then say, yeah, I'm going to marry you. You want to make sure that you like them back and that it is a strong platform for yourself. And I think that that starts internally looking at what have I been most proud of in my career? What kind of two to three really strong examples of deals that I have worked on that has brought me the most happiest? Or it's, you know, practice areas moving is, is kind of difficult, but within one's practice group, so say it's corporate and you're in fund formation or private investment funds and you realize you want to get a little bit more generalist experience, what kind of platform would give me that opportunity to branch out and kind of get a, a wider set of experience? So once you come up with that, I very important to put together a deal sheet. Now, that's not applicable to every single practice area, but every single candidate that I have with a deal sheet almost always gets an interview. It's because it makes you stand out. When you're looking at inter resume after resume of drafted, negotiated, assisted counsel, <laughs> it's the same words over and over again. But when you can actually say, hey, I worked with this pharmaceutical company and their acquisition of XYZ, then it actually gives some merit and some beef to your resume. So I think prior planning is key. When you're looking at platforms, and this is where a recruiter can really come in and help out, especially if it is a relocation like you made, it's knowing what firms are shops in the market and the reasons why. Knowing, obviously, the reputation in the market of the different cultures of the different firms is very key. That's why we actually go out when we do client visits. We try to physically do an office visit, see the environment, talk to the support staff. Because for me, I think that that's the strongest. If you talk to paralegals and even the receptionists and just see how happy they are and how they're treated and what they love about the firm, it's a huge indicator of just the firm culture in and of itself. Seeing how people dress in the attire, and you can tell right away when it's kind of a stuffier more of a white shoe environment, or if it's a more collegial, you know, business casual, think tank, trying to move towards that tech startup vibe. And even that, that's a huge seller too when, when talking to candidates, because then they know, you know, what they're getting themselves into without going to something blindly. I think candidates, you know, doing research on the actual firm that you're interviewing with, working, you know, if you're using a recruiter, even on your own, Go online, pull up the the revenues, pull up the firm health, pull up that information. You know, what patents, if it's IP, what patents have they filed? Actually do research, uh, you know, beyond the, oh, they're right this in the country. This is their billable hours. This is, you know, what the cost going to be. Sign me up. <laughs> you you 
want to know what it is. I also have my favorite trick, and it's looking up what the alumni network is like. Now, the focus is not obviously towards making a lateral move, but look at what your resources are. Do a lot of people go in-house? And you can do a LinkedIn search and just say past company, put in the firm, and see, or do a lot of associates end up going in-house? And is that an end game for me? And this might be my next best move? Great. Then that's a platform for there. Are there a lot of people who have been homegrown partners and they actually have a true track record of that? Then LinkedIn can prove that for you. Or if you see a lot of, you know, competitor firms as well. So I think, you know, doing the research from that perspective also gives you a good insight into if you really want to make partner, maybe moving to a regional or mid-sized firm where it's an easier book requirement to break into. There's less client conflicts and it's a wider base to build on, that might be great. Maybe it's going in-house and you know a firm is known for helping out with with those placements because they want to build relations with their clients. I know I've worked with some big law who have career development systems in place within their own firm to actually get associates into those positions just so then it good, builds goodwill between the client and the firm. And then it's all working with the same characters. Oh my goodness. I mean, (laughs) what I love about that response is I don't think people realize what a great resource a lateral, a recruiter is and that you guys are really knowledgeable, not just about the market, but about firms and all the different options there are out there. And I think some people go into it feeling like their recruiter is like a car salesman. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, completely. And there are those recruiters out there, to be fair. There are definitely a variety of recruiters out there. Oh, absolutely. But I think that if you don't realize that there are better options, you kind of just sign yourself up for this horrible experience. And my favorite thing about what you said was with each step, you need to know why. Like, it's not just about doing the research. It's about why that matters, you know? And I think sometimes people just take abstract concepts and compare them and are like, well, this is objectively better than the other and don't really reflect on whether that, how that implicates to them in their life. Completely. And I think to kind of spin off that, it's say you're in no offense to a Honda Civic, but say you're driving a Honda Civic, maybe it's a little beat up, you've had it for 10 years and you go and you test drive a Ferrari. Now, you might not end up in a Ferrari, but you go back to your Honda Civic and you start looking at what's wrong with it, <laughs> what, it what it doesn't have versus the Ferrari. And then you actually get a little bit more upset with the car you have. And then you get in your mind that you need a new car. And so my whole goal, too, as a recruiter is not just to get you the unoffer because I get very – I actually get very scared if – a candidate only has one offer and they just want to accept it just because it's a new job. My goal is to try to get a candidate put up as many firms as I can, keep actively interviewing because to use another analogy, like real estate, you're not going to buy the first house you walk into. You want to make sure you visit the different environments. You know what looks right for you. You know, sometimes it is that one offer might make sense and it's a good fit and it might be your only opportunity and that's fine. But if, if you're a really hot and marketable candidate and you know that you have really good skill set that you can bring to a firm, I just, I would just make sure that you do do your due diligence and not just take the first offer that comes your way because I've seen candidates get burned and realize, you know, maybe that one our meeting where they got an offer on the spot didn't actually pan out to what they really thought it would be, which is fair because how much do you know about anything after an hour? And so that's where if I've ever had candidates, you know, have some questions, I'll go back to the firm and say, hey, do you mind if I set up a lunch between the associate and this candidate just so they can just get a better sense of, you know, the day to day? No firm has ever come back and said, why are they not interested in us? Why would I do that? No, they, they love that. They love that people are doing their due diligence and actually making sure that it's a good culture fit for them because retention and losing a candidate is a very costly process. And so they want to make sure that it, it's a good move for everybody involved. And if the firm says no, that's a red flag, right? It is completely. And that's where... Unfortunately, I've had a candidate say, should I disclose if I have children? And my my answer is, you know, completely up to you. But would you be comfortable at a firm that you're, you're not comfortable disclosing your children at? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> and that's where you know you have to you have to think about that. Like if everyone, I think, when they go to interview, they try to paint this perfect picture of themselves, and that's all a resume is. I actually I read about that. It's a resume is a list of all your best accomplishments with all the negative taken out. So it's just like you go and you meet someone, you want them to actually know what your personality is like, how you work, how you function. Are you someone that loves to, you know, go pedal to the metal for an hour, go grab a coffee, then come back and take breaks? Are you someone who locks himself in a room with the headphones on and just bangs it out? Are you an early riser, a night bird? Um, there's, there's just a lot of personalities out there. So it's hard when you're having a really quick meeting to make a, a really strong evaluation of culture fit. No, I definitely had a lot more of those types of questions when I went through the process because I had been practicing for long enough that I knew how I practiced and who I like to practice with and the way I like to practice. So it was easier for me to ask the kinds of questions, especially once I had the offer in hand, I did a lot of follow-up calls and tried to see what time do people typically leave? Do people feel like they need to sit around the office when they have no work? Do people feel like they can't bring their children to like family events, even though they're like billed as family friendly, like, you know, all these types of things that you can't know unless you ask. Completely. And that's where hopefully, you know, as a recruiter, you try to get all that information at the outset. But if you are doing it on your own, especially if you are relocating on your own, it, it is important to try to find an ally within the firm that you're comfortable dealing with that versus, you know, just talking to an HR manager who really, you know, has a script and doesn't know what the day to day is. Well, this has been so fantastic. And I've learned a lot. And I wish I had known to ask you all these questions before I made my own move. And I'm happy that things worked out for me, but I definitely would have learned a lot. But before I let you go, is there anything that you wish lawyers, associates knew about the process that would make your job easier and make their lives a little bit better? Yes, that we are in it just as much as they are. So we do a lot behind the scenes. So we always try to target going out to clients, you know, multiple times throughout the week, going and assessing the environment learning about like year end and Q1, what their 2017 plans are, how their year is wrapped up, what are their associate retention initiatives like? And that's where it's, there's a lot more strategy involved versus just that cold call of, hey, do you want to make a move? <laughs> Which no one should phrase it as, but <laughs> there, there's it's just a lot more intensive. And if you're working with the right recruiter, I think it's important to work with a recruiter that knows an individual market. Um, I know my company, we have 38 offices nationwide, but each market is very different. So I would be cautious of working with someone who knows what their individual market is, how their candidacy fits into play within the market, their strength of their candidacy. Someone who's truthful, I, I think that that's important. Of Hey, you know, there's a, this is the type of firms you should be targeting and why. I think promising everyone big law you know, no matter what firm they're coming from is, is silly because not everyone that's a good fit for. Or same thing with in-house. In-house is not a perfect nine to five world. It is not the dreamscape that everyone kind of heads it to be. I can't tell you how many in-house job orders that have worse hours than big law and then comp isn't tied to vocal. So you're doing the same work for less hours, but you're getting back end bonuses. It's important to vet who you're working with, but they there are good and bad recruiters. So the moral of the story is just know who you're working with, get references, ask, ask who, you know, your, your colleagues have worked with too, if you're ever entertaining a move. Thank you so much. You. What's the best way for people to reach you if they want to learn more? LinkedIn, always. You can look me up at Kelly DiMatteo, and I am the division director of Parker and Lynch Legal. I am located in New England, but if you are interested in any national opportunities, I could set you up with the right person. Sounds good. And I'll put that all in the show notes for people so they can access it through my website as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. Perfect. Thank you. You have a great day. Thank you for joining me for the Happy Lawyer Project podcast. Please head over to my website, www.thehappylawyerproject.com for more information from today's show. While you're there, I'd love it if you'd leave me your thoughts on the show. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or follow me on Instagram. If you've enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to head over to iTunes to subscribe and review the show. As you know, each rating helps more listeners find the show and helps me get awesome guests on here for you guys. 
If there's anyone you'd like me to have on the show, or if you'd like to be on the show, head over to my website and let me know, or send me an email at akoma, O-K-E-O-M-A, at thehappylawyerproject.com. A special thanks to everyone who's left a review, sent me an email, or reached out to me in any way. I appreciate you. Thank you again for spending this time with me. And if you would like to learn more about working in your gift and living your passion, head over to the website for a free gift. Until next time, bye. Thank you.